Awesome. Thank you, Ben. Uh, uh, if you don't know me, um, uh, my name is Steve. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad to be here this morning. Uh, in fact, I'm very excited to be here this morning. Are you guys excited to be here this morning? Um, yeah. Uh, not, not because, not, not necessarily because of me, but because, uh, hey, we get to hear from God's word today. Uh, we get to hear from God's word. I'm really excited about that. I, uh, I think sometimes I, I underrate that in my life, you know, the privilege of getting to hear from God's word, the fact that we have uh, this thing called a Bible and we have copies of it and we get to read it. Um, unfortunately, I think a lot of the time uh, we read it and we partake and it's really uncomfortable, like reading it. <laughs> it's really uncomfortable because it it talks about things that we kind of know, but they're hard to speak about, right? So uh, Nate asked me to come here and participate in your summer series called The Search. Uh, I still haven't found what I'm looking for, and I love that because I'm such a U2 fan. I was like, yeah, this is, this is awesome. Um, it's going to pump me right up for preaching, um, and it's true. And uh, you guys are going through the book of Ecclesiastes, and I love Ecclesiastes because I call Ecclesiastes a deep cut. In, in scripture, you know, uh, those music fans that are talking about, yeah, you might know the hits on an album, you know, the book of John, Genesis, Revelation, all the ones that get all the, get all the plays, but Ecclesiastes is a deep cut in scripture. It's, it doesn't get played very often, uh, but when it does, it's got some really good return, man. It's got some really, really good stuff. Um, so before we dive in, um, I, I really hope uh, I really hope that you guys are tuning in to this, uh, because as I prepared this message, um, God really worked some things over in my heart, and this is probably the most convicting message that I've ever prepared for me. Like, it was the most convicting for me <laughs> as I was preparing it. It was a very uncomfortable preparation process. Um, so I'm hoping that that will bear some fruit this morning for us. Um, so before we get started, I am going to describe a few scenarios to you, okay? I'm going to describe some scenarios and just, you know, through your active listening uh, and, and maybe some vocal listening, I'm okay with that. Remember, shout amen if, if, that's, if you hear something, you're like, yeah, that, that's, I identify with that. I'm, amen doesn't mean I've got it down. Amen means that I want to get it down, right? Like, so, you know, do that stuff. Uh, be participatory. I love that. Uh, so I'm going to describe some scenarios to you, and in your reactions, uh, just see if you find them familiar, and we're going to see if we can find a common denominator in all these scenarios, okay? So uh, you ready? There are two people ready on this side of the room. Everybody else is not prepared for what's about to happen. <laughs> Here we go. When the coffee runs out. <laughs> I think I just heard my sister gasp audibly. When Qdoba runs out of queso or guac. When friends ended. Half the people in the room are like, what's friends? I don't know. It's on Netflix. Okay. The last day of vacation. When breakfast hours, see, okay, see, this is something that maybe younger people are not going to identify with, but for those of us that are a little bit older, we remember when McDonald's was not serving breakfast all hours of the day, when breakfast was over at McDonald's, and all you wanted was a hash brown, and you're like, can you get me a hash brown, please? And they're like, I'm sorry, it's 10.32 a.m. We no longer serve hash browns. <sighs> all right, give me a Big Mac. At 10.30 in the morning. When the Reese's Pieces runs out. And it was finished by the person who gave it to you as a gift. If that sounds really specific, it's because I'm still healing. Um, a little more serious now. A little more serious now. When, uh, maybe when an athlete has to play their last game. Uh, maybe for those of you that are parents of college students, when you drop your kid off to college for the first time, end of an era, right? Uh, maybe even uh, even more heavy than that, you uh, you get a diagnosis and you know my life's never going to be the same after this, right? 
what you knew is not going to be anymore. Maybe you know, you know what it's like, and I do too, unfortunately, to walk out of a hospital and know I'm probably never going to speak to that person in this life again. Here's the uncomfortable reality I think we're all commonly aware of, but I think we don't often live like we're very aware of it because we just want to avoid it. Uh, and here's the reality. Uh, everything good ends. <laughs> right now you guys are like, I don't know if I want Nate to invite him to come back anymore. <laughs> He's preaching a bummer. But it's true. I think that we're aware of this. And I think that there's a, there's a temptation that we have. For those of you that are maybe not, uh, you haven't said yes to Christ yet, and you're just kind of exploring the church thing, you'll have to permit me for a couple of minutes to talk to just some church people that have been in church circles for a long time. I think we have a temptation. And I think the temptation is for us to, because we kind of know the Sunday school answer, right? We know the Sunday school answer. Jesus, right? Uh, heaven, we're going to, I'll fly away, oh glory, right? So, you guys remember that song, right? We have a temptation to go right to the, I mean, right to the easy answer. And here's the thing. I'm not even saying that's not the answer. But the problem is, is that when we don't allow ourselves to be challenged by the question, we can position ourselves in a way in life in which we, we know the answer, but we're not living like we know the answer. And so I am asking you today to go here with me. This is going to be a difficult message. It's a difficult topic. It's not, I do not... I was not looking forward to preaching this one. Uh, you know, don't blame me. Blame Solomon, okay? I'm just preaching what's there. I, I'm just preaching what's there. But it's the uncomfortable reality. We all know it. Things come to an end. And we need to remember that as Solomon is writing in Ecclesiastes, right, at the time that he's, that he's constructing these thoughts, he, is not, he does not have a developed uh, thought system for the afterlife. He doesn't, he doesn't have a lot of that. It was not very well developed in, in spiritual teaching at that point yet. So for him, he's doing an analysis of life from birth to death. That is what he's doing. And we are going to bear the most fruit out of our uh, search through Ecclesiastes today and the rest of the series if we go about it with the same perspective and allow ourselves to be challenged by the truth that's there uh, don't assume that just because you know the answer, that means you're automatically living like you know the answer, okay? So uh, I know that that's a truth I'm very challenged by in my life. Feel the tension today. Don't be afraid to uh, be bothered a little bit and to be made a little bit uncomfortable. I promise you, you're going to walk out today uplifted if you really tune in, I hope. <laughs> uh, so just remember that, but let yourself be challenged. So uh, let's dive in. We're going to be in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 2. 12. We're going to start in verse 12, and we're going, to, we're going to go through verse 25 today in this section. Ecclesiastes 12. So you can turn there in your Bible. This first section of verses I'm going to read is not going to be on the screen, actually. So uh, follow along with me. I encourage you to. Here's the central question that we're going to ask today, that we're going to search out. We're going to go after it, and it's this. How in the world can we have meaning and purpose that does not go away in a world where everything does? That's the question. How can we have meaning and purpose in the life that doesn't go away in a world where everything does? Life plays a dirty magic trick on us, right? Things go into our life, and then they leave our lives. And, and it's like, now you see it, now you don't, right? I feel like that a lot. I feel like that a lot. Um, and there's something that it produces, I think, inside of us, and, and, and we're going to begin in verse 12 here to explore this. So uh, read along with me. This is Solomon saying, Then I turned my thoughts to consider wisdom and also madness and folly. What more can the king's successor do than what has already been done? I saw that wisdom is better than folly, just as light is better than darkness. The wise have eyes in their heads while the fool walks in the darkness. But I came to realize, here's our reality, that the same fate overtakes them both. Then I said to myself, the fate of the... Fool will overtake me also. What then do I gain by being wise? What's the point in being wise? Have you ever asked yourself this question? Have you ever asked God this question? If this is the reality that I live in where good things come to an end, what is the point in being good? What is the point in doing it the way you want me to do it? If you haven't asked yourself that question, then keep living for a while 
and, uh, and, and check back with me later <laughs> because you probably will at some point. For the wise, like the fool, uh, will not be long remembered. Let's go back a verse. I said to myself, this too is meaningless. For the wise, like the fool, will not long be remembered. The days have already come when both have been forgotten. Like the fool, the wise must die. So he's saying here's three main ways in which we could possibly do life. You can be wise, you can be a fool, or you can be right out of your mind. And really, that's kind of the three categories. <laughs> uh, some of you are like, I've, I've gone through those three categories in one afternoon at work. So you understand that this is true. And he's saying, listen, you play the tape through all the way to the end. And maybe the, yeah, being wise is better than being a fool because we kind of see that in life. But you know what? At the end of the day, all three of them die. The same fate overtakes all of them. And he's asking himself, what does it mean? And he uses a very, very important phrase in there, a couple of important phrases. One, he says, they, they, both, they both die. And this is, this is the very incredibly difficult word here today. Because I know that there's some of us in this room that are facing this reality head on. You know this. You're walking through it. And I think sometimes we as Christians, we have a temptation not to take death as seriously as we should. 1 Corinthians 15 says that death is the final enemy. It's an enemy. It is your enemy. It is not your friend. Don't let anybody ever tell you that it's a natural part of life. It is the least natural thing that could ever happen to you. God never designed your body to be split from your spirit. It was never supposed to be that way. And when we diminish the force and effect of death, we diminish what Jesus did on the cross. So this is uncomfortable but he uses another key word in there. The word is meaningless. Nate already talked about this, and he said meaningless is the Hebrew word hevel, right? It's the Hebrew word hevel, and it basically means uh, to, it basically means vapor, right? Vapor, uh, breath, um, smoke, right? But what's awesome about Hebrew is that it doesn't just give you a definition of a word, it also gives you a word picture. It also gives you a mental image for what it is. So, so, and even different places in Ecclesiastes, if you read uh, the rest of the book, uh, he sometimes follows that word up with a definition. He actually self-defines his own word. It's meaningless, and then he says, a chasing after the wind. He's defining the word, he's giving you the word picture. And so really the best thing I could come up with to help illustrate this is the nature of smoke. So I'm going to blow this candle out, and then I'm going to make a motion that is the mental picture for what Solomon is trying to communicate when he says, this is life. This is, this is hevel. The smoke rises, and I try to get it in my hands. That's the chasing after the wind. It's grasping at smoke. It's grasping at something that you can see, it's there, you can smell it, you can experience it, and the moment you try to grab it in your hands, it's out of your hands. That motion right there, Hevel, that's what he's saying. He's saying, I'm looking at the rest of life, I'm looking at all of life, and this is what it is. It's smoke in front of me, and when I try to grab it, it's, gone. it's a chasing after the wind. That's life. Some of you might be more acquainted with this feeling than others at the current moment, depending on your season. But I think that today, if you really tune in, I think that I think everybody here will be challenged by this. Because, see, this is what we do. Grasping biblically means that I am holding on to something so tightly that I refuse to lose it under any circumstances. Right? And to lose it would be an unacceptable reality. We do this with life itself, but we also do it with other things. We do it with a relationship. We do it with a career. Right? I cannot lose this job, this career. We do it with um, finances, with wealth, possessions, maybe property. Maybe that's what we do it with. We grab onto it. Right? What about, uh, what about health? That's mine. That's my big one. Health for me. Right? What about good looks? <laughs> Some of you are like, I never had that to begin with. Right? <laughs> Maybe you can relate to this. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was having a hard time sleeping. And so I, I went and looked in the mirror in the morning. I was like, man, I look tired. I just look tired right now. Just have like resting tired face all the time. And then I got better sleep a little bit and checked back in a few weeks later. I was like, oh, 
No, that's just how I look now. I'm not, must not have been tight. Oh man, see, and the box and the bald spot's bigger, right? Mine is, and it it, it starts to. This is why I'm growing it out right now. I'm trying to hold on, right? I'm trying to grasp is what we do. We grab. What what about your kids? Can't let go of your kids. What about uh, your, needing your kids to behave a certain way? Needing your kids to live a certain kind of life. You know, follow the family line or the fa- what, you know, any of those things we try to grab onto. And what about, and this is, might be uncomfortable for some people in the room, myself included, what about the way that you think church should be? Grab on. The way that you think, the way you think the music should sound, you know? I, I'm, I am, I am, I'm going to be there soon, <laughs> someday. In some cases, I already am. <laughs> Someday, there's going to be crazy, awesome worship going on in a church. I'm going to be like, what happened? Right? It's going to happen to me, too. This is the reality. This is, I told you this is going to be an uncomfortable message. You just got to apply it where it hurts. Okay? This is uncomfortable for me, and I think it's uncomfortable for all of us because we have to be challenged by it. This is what we do. We grasp at life. And different things, because we assume that they're going to bring us meaning and purpose. We assume that they're going to make things make sense, that they're going to be things that bring us the fulfillment that we're looking for, and then it tends not to be that way. So I'm praying that the Holy Spirit is already bringing things into your mind right now that you might be doing this with. And we're going to, we're going to do some surgery today, folks. We're going, to do some, we're going to do some close looks here at what's happening. Don't, don't allow yourself off the hook quite yet. I think that God has something really cool for you if you're challenged by this. So a couple of things we're going to do, we're going to look at that motion, that grasping, that chasing after the wind that Solomon talks about, and I can do this without shaking. Goodness gracious. You guys make me nervous. Okay. We're going to look at that motion, grasping. What does it, what does it look like? Number one, we've got to diagnose it in our lives. And number two, what does it do Right? What are the consequences of living a life in which I am grasping at things that aren't going to last, that I'm refusing to lose them, that I'm doing that? And then the third thing, what do we do about it? What do we do about it? Okay, so uh, first of all, what grasping looks like. And I'm hoping, I really hope, I know this is a difficult subject. I know it's a heavy one. I'm really, really hoping that we can have some fun still here today. So uh, I've got some video clips for y'all. You like video clips? <laughs> I got some good ones, I hope. All right, so first off, uh, let's read on Ecclesiastes chapter 2, 17 through 19. I'm going to read these verses, and then we're going to get going. So, I hated life. Okay. <clears throat> because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. See what I told that hevel, grabbing after the smoke. I hated all the things that I toil for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me and who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish. Anybody relate to this? Yet they will have control over all the fruit of my toil into which I poured my effort and my skill under the sun. This too is hevel, meaningless, right? I've acquired all this stuff. I've worked so hard to build up my position in life and then When I go, it's going to go to someone else, and they might be stupid. What what Solomon's doing right now is he's he's identifying the cycle of grasping. He's identifying the cycle of grasping, and I think think it helps us know what grasping looks like. It looks like three things, I think. It looks like I, I want, I have, and I lost. I want... I have, and I lost. I think this is the cycle of grasping. That's what it looks like. So let's break each of these down here a little bit. I got a little video clip to go with each one of them for you visual learners out there. Uh, I'm really, I'm too, I'm building this up too much. I'm excited. I'm too excited for it. But you guys are like, those clips are not very good. But we'll see what happens. So first one, I want. I want. People who are in this phase of grasping at life, uh, they, they tend to define themselves by what they don't have yet. Tend to define themselves by what they don't have yet. They are focused and fixed on what is to come and totally bypassing what is, right? They tend to say things like this. If I don't find someone to marry soon, I don't know what I'm going to do. 
if my blank job, uh, relationship, financial status doesn't change, my life is just going to be miserable. When I get in shape, then, then I'll be happy. That's, a, that's been a challenge for me. I've struggled with my weight my whole life, in my, my adult life. That's been a big temptation for me. Man, when I get to that point, then life really begins, right? When we get into our forever home, then we will be generous and have people over. I want. Uh, people grasping in this phase are fully convinced that the thing that they are grasping after and waiting for is the silver bullet that's going to bring them meaning and purpose in their whole lives. But what if this isn't the case? What if it's not? My wife and I were watching Friends the other night, and, uh, and we came across this scene, and we both made note of it. She made note of it faster than I did because she's smarter than me. So then I listened to her, and I was like, okay, this is, this is something really useful. Uh, here's the thing. With these clips, I want you to put your grasping goggles on, okay? I want you to look at this and go, okay, where is the grasp? See if you can identify it. In this scene, Rachel, the character Rachel, is lamenting the fact that she has totally left her orthodontist fiancé in exchange for something better, or at least what she perceives to be something better. Guys, check out the clip. That right there. That question. I think people who are grasping in the I want phase of life think that there are magic beans out there. If I can just get a hold of them and plant them, then I get this beanstalk, and it'll provide everything. This career will provide everything that I've been looking for. This relationship will provide everything, whatever it is. And they put it in the ground, and nothing happens, because guess what? There are no magic beans. They're just beans. And sometimes the beans are not good. They're like kidney beans. They're just not good beans. I apologize if you're a kidney bean fan. But... They're not. Sometimes the beans are good. Sometimes you get a really great lot in life. God gives you a blessing and it's really great. But guess what? What if they're still just beans? And you know what? Actually, I think that can be a good thing. And we'll get to that in a little bit. But if you've identified with any of that, you might be, might be an I want grasper. You might be grasping at life in that way. You're like a pre-grasper. You're setting yourself up for that phase of life, all right? What, what about the next, what about I have? What about I have? People in this phase of life that are grasping, they think they've captured the magic beans, right? They think they've got a hold of them, and they tend to say things like, look what I've accomplished. It doesn't get any better than this, right? This is what life is all about. And then on the flip side, if I lost blank, then my life would be over. Because I got them. I have them in my grasp. I got the magic beans. And they're providing it. You, you, feel, you feel like you do this a little bit? Let me show you another fun little clip. Okay? This one's from the new movie, Spider-Man, Homecoming. Any of you superhero fans out there? Yeah, Marvel fans? Some of you are not willing to admit it because you're afraid people will think you're a nerd. I'm a proud nerd. All right, and don't worry, I'm not, I'm not, no spoiler alerts here. I'm not showing, if you haven't seen the movie yet, I'm not showing, I'm showing you something that's in one of the trailers, okay? So uh, if, if, if you get mad at me for that, then it's your own fault, okay? So, uh, so again, put your grasping goggles on, put them on, all right? This is the I have phase of life. When we have something and we're grasping onto it so tightly, we refuse to lose it. We define ourselves by it, okay? So check out this clip, that. I'm going to need the suit back. But I'm nothing without this suit. If you're nothing without the suit, you shouldn't have it. A little bit of strangely biblical wisdom there coming from Tony Stark. Why? Because Peter Parker thinks he's got the magic beans, right? If you look at the comic book, He's, a, he's, like a, he's like a nerd. He's a, he's a, he gets bullied all the time in school. And he's been looking for that thing, that thing. And when he grabs it, it brings his life meaning and purpose and all of that stuff. It makes him someone. And then when it gets taken away from him, he's like, no, 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 no. I'm nothing without this. You ever feel that way? You think you're doing this? You know, uh, I think I do this all the time. I mentioned my health before. This is part of what I struggle with, with anxiety, 
because like I over obsess about things. Like I look at that mark in my arm, I'm like, uh oh. And it's like a paper cut, but I think it's something worse, <laughs> right? Because I'm grabbing a man. If I don't have my health, if I don't have my youth, if I don't have those things, then then what am I going to be? I think we do this with a lot of things, and I think that I think that if we're not careful, we set ourselves up to grasp at the smoke of life, and we suffer the consequences. We'll talk about those in a minute. So if you identify with any of that, you might be an I have grasper. You think you got it, man. You've got the cottage and the, the, maybe the sea dew and the, the lake house, and you know, you're making it rain, <laughs> right? You think you got a hold of it? Solomon says it's smoke. Solomon says it's smoke. If you identify with that, you might be an I have grasper. By the way, I identify with both of these so far, just to let you know. So now here's the third one. What about this one? I lost. This one's more difficult. People in this phase of life, they tend to be former I have graspers who then got the thing that they thought they had in their hands ripped away. They tend to be this way. They tend to say things like, Oh, they just don't make them like they used to. Right? Back then, that's when things were really good. Now I'm just, I'm just getting by. Just dealing with life. It's not what it once was. Slowly removing myself from relevancy. See, this, we do this all the time. I would trade away whatever time I have left for one day back then. I lost. I lost something. We lose things. We lose things, and it's horrible. It's horrible. Solomon is looking at this thing. He's looking at a whole life that he has probably lost already and going, how in the world that happened? He's the wisest, richest, most powerful guy ever in the world, and now it's gone. He's looking at the time that is running out, and he's thinking these were not magic beans. They were just beans. I lost. Take a look at this really short clip. Any Pixar fans out there? Any Pixar fans? Hopefully this will give you a little bit slightly, you know, light perspective on what this might look like. Check it out. We lose things. Uh, Up is one of my favorite Pixar movies ever, but it opens with like the saddest eight minutes in movie history. You see this guy go from I want to I have to I lost in like eight minutes and then you're like, I I don't know how to emotionally recover from that. We lose things. And I think this reality makes us do this. We see the smoke, we experience it, and we grasp. And we grasp for dear life and we try to hang on. Try to get hold of the magic beans. And we end up in a lot of heartbreak. I think God, through Solomon, is trying to help us take a fierce, long, hard look at what the reality is. So that it can produce something inside of us. It can produce a wisdom inside of us. Now, we've kind of looked at what grasping looks like. Now, we're going to continue on with Solomon. And we're going to take this one level deeper. And uh, just go here with me because I really do believe that as we allow ourselves to be challenged by this, it's going to produce something inside of us that will bear fruit later on. So we've looked at what grasping looks like. Now we need to look at what grasping does. We need to look at the consequences because if, if there's something that we're doing that's unhealthy for us, um, one of the best strategies, not the only, but the be- one of the best strategies for, for not doing this anymore is to, is to be very well acquainted with what it's doing to you. Right? I think that my... My expense list will bear me out on this, right? You go down it, and you see, oh, Wendy's again. Not healthy for me. <laughs> but the more that I become acquainted to what the Wendy's is doing to me, <laughs> it gives me more ammunition to maybe do things a little differently. So now, what does grasping do? Ecclesiastes 2, verses 20 to 23 Follow along as I read these. So my heart began to despair, look at these key words, over all my toilsome labor under the sun. For a person may labor with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then they must leave all that they own to another who has not toiled for it. 
This too is meaningless. It's hevel and a great misfortune. What do people get for all the toil and anxious striving with which they labor under the sun? All their days, their work is grief and pain. Even at night, their minds do not rest. This too is meaningless. It appears that Solomon is correctly diagnosing what has happened to him and what is happening to many people around him in the, art, in the, in the, in the, in the, the doing of clinging to things that go away. So what does it do? Well, let's, let's take our same framework, all right? I, I want, I have, I lost. Let's look at that and let's apply it to this part. What, what does it do? What is it doing to us? So I want... Do you guys want anything? It's good to have desires and dreams. It really is. It's, it's very important. It's very important to have desires and dreams. And if we're going about it with a level head and a level heart, we should be discouraged but content. Right? As I go through life. Bible said it's not wrong to be discouraged. It's not wrong to be discouraged. It's what I do with the discouragement. Right? It's not wrong to be discouraged, but I can be content as I go through life. Right? Contentment by definition means that I would change something if I could, but I can't, so I'm going to still have joy, be content. Possible to do both at the same time, but the problem is if we are, if we are not just living life, but if we're grasping at life or looking to grasp at life, people who are in the I want phase tend to be panicked and envious instead. Panicked and envious instead. Reach, they reach for escape and live in fantasy. I know what this is like. I'm married now. I got married at 32, but I, I lived my entire 20s as a single man. I know what that's like. All of those applied to me. They still do in some ways. Grasping in the section of life, doing this this way, it wrecks your rating system. Right? It really does. It wrecks your rating system because you no longer appropriately value things. You are overvaluing the thing that you're going after and waiting for and devaluing everything else when in reality, the situation is much more equal, right? And we tend to trade things away, right, for this. You remember the prodigal son? Jesus told a story in Luke 15 about a son who, was, who could not wait for the inheritance from his father, so he demanded it early, Right? traded his whole life away for that piece of money, that wealth, and then he went and squandered it and discovered that the life that he was after wasn't really what he thought he wanted. Right? Jesus tells this story. Let's be real. Anybody here do this? Right? Maybe you're single and you're 27 and you're starting to hit the panic button, so you're maybe dating some people who shouldn't be dating. Going after some things you shouldn't be going after because you've been unfulfilled and you're not sure that God is going to fulfill you. Right? Maybe, uh, maybe you've done, maybe you're an adult and you've got a family and you've done this with your finances. You have compromised your family's financial status because you grasped at a lifestyle that was never yours to begin with. Maybe you've done this. I've done this. This is what the I want phase does to you. What about I have? What about I have? I have these things. They're great things. I have my health somewhat right now, maybe, you know. I got some looks and, you know, they're, you know, I'm not the most good looking dude ever, you know, but hey, uh, people don't run away scared when they see me, so it's good. Like, I've got something, right? Maybe you've got some kind of um, a savings account, you got an emergency fund, maybe, something like that. Like, that's good. We should be realistic and grateful. When we have things, realistic and grateful, I know that what I have is not mine, right? Pastor Nate's talked about this, hasn't he? I know what I have is not mine. It comes from God. But if we're grasping at the things that we have, grasping at the smoke in our lives, we tend to be anxious and greedy instead because you have something, but you can't even enjoy it because you spend most of the time worried about when you're going to lose it. Makes us obsessed with safety. I can't risk anything because I might lose something, right? It makes you gripped by the fear of losing the thing or you have so much that you've been lulled to sleep by what's in your hands or what you think is in your hands and you neglect the brevity of life. 
Jesus has something to say about this, right? In Luke chapter 12, Luke chapter 12, Jesus tells a little story. And he tells a story about what they call the rich fool. And he said, I've got so much, I've got so many things, I don't even have enough room to hold the stuff that I have. Right? This is, this is the character that Jesus paints. And then he goes on and he says this, starting in verse 19. He says, and I'll say to myself, self, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. You fool. You grasped the magic beans because you thought that's what life was all about. and You made your whole life about that thing that you wanted because it felt good. And it's smoke in your hands. Jesus doesn't want us to be fools. He doesn't want us to be lulled to sleep by life like that. And a few verses later, he says, Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Nobody can. I can't do it. What about I lost? What does that do? I want to be real sensitive here because there's a lot of people in this room, myself included, who have lost some really important, valuable, incredible things. We lost some people. And it is an incredibly difficult thing. It is not the way that life was supposed to be. But if we are clinging to the Lord as opposed to trying to grasp at the things that we lose, we should be grieving but hopeful. We should grieve the things that we lost because they're good things, right? They're just, remember what I said, what if they're not magic beans, they're just beans, but some of the beans are really good and they're from God and they should be enjoyed and when they're lost, they should be grieved because sin has done this to our world, right? To our existence, this is why it is. But we should, be, we should season that grieving with hope. But if we are not doing that, we're grasping at the smoke, we tend to be bitter and hopeless instead. I lost this thing. Life is not what it used to be, and I am angry about it. You see, you, t- you know, the, the, make, that, make that motion right there. You're grasping at something, and there's nothing there. What does it do eventually to you? Does it make you tired? Medically, do you know this? Medically, that you, you, can actually, you can actually raise your blood pressure by making a fist. Anxious greedy, bitter, hopeless, you get stuck in time because you get, you get put in an endless loop if you are grasping at the things that you thought you once had but never really had a grip on to begin with. You're stuck in time, you're in an endless loop, and you're unable to experience God's current blessings and joy and the things that he's doing right now because you are so, so hooked on what once was. I lost Solomon knows the stories. I'm going to read one to you briefly here. Solomon knows the stories. See, Solomon's king right now, as he's writing Ecclesiastes, but a couple of kings before him, there was a king named Saul. And God appointed Saul, and God gave Saul all the power and the, 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 the wisdom and all of the things that he needed to rule, and Saul fell in love with the power as opposed to falling in love with God. And God said, enough. And I'm just going to read it to you. This is not on the screen. Samuel said to him, I will not go back with you. This is the prophet Samuel delivering God's news. I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of God, and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. As Samuel turned to leave, Saul caught a hold of the hem of his robe, and it tore. And Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to one of your neighbors, to one better than you. Harsh words. Saul was grasping so hard at the things that were in his life and the things that he was losing that he tore Samuel's robe with his fist. (laughs) And he never let go. He never let go to the point of his own death. He never let go. He never understood what God wanted. He thought that God wanted all of his, like 
good deeds and things like that, when in reality, God was like, Saul, you didn't get it. I never cared about the sacrifices and the sheep. I wanted you. I wanted your heart. I wanted you to trust me. I wanted you to cling after me, not the power. He lost. Grasping at the smoke of life. It's there. I can see it. And when I try to hold on to it, grasp it so I don't lose it, it's out of my hands. I want, I have, I lost. I want, I have, I lost. And some of you here, you go through this cycle over and over and over and over again in life. I do. I do. Every single day. Every single day. Every single day. It's a daily thing. So, here's the question. If this is what grasping looks like and this is what it does, right? Maybe you have uncomfortably self-diagnosed yourself here this morning. I hope you have for your spiritual well-being. But I told you that I'd preach you uplifted. So what do we do? What do we do about it? What do we do? Grasping at the things in life that are temporary, they're, they're good beans, but they're not magic beans. What do we do about this? Well, all right, so... We have been in Ecclesiastes, right? So uh, let's say uh, we go, uh, we realize that I've been making this motion a lot in life, right? And uh, it hurts. It really hurts. So I'm going to go to Dr. Solomon at Wisdom Hospital, and I'm going to say, hey, uh, Doc, I'm doing this thing and it hurts a lot. And he's going to look at you and go, yeah, stop doing that. Seriously, though. Check out what he says, verse 24. A person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. This, too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, this is a key phrase, who can eat or find enjoyment? Do nothing better than to eat and drink. Does that sound familiar? Does it sound like the rich fool to you? Eat and drink and be merry? Well, it's kind of similar. So there's one key difference. The rich fool is clinging at the things of life. And Solomon is saying, don't cling at those, cling at God. This comes from the hand of God. And you let him, you let the Lord God decide, and this is really difficult, but it has to be said, you let the Lord God decide if and when and how and how long. You let him decide if and when and how and how long. It's the only way to enjoy life. It's the only way to enjoy temporary life. It's the only way to do it, and all of our lives are temporary. They just are. Same for me, same for you. I have to say it that way. The only way to actually do that is to let him decide if, when, how, and how long. doesn't matter what it is. To not grasp onto those things. Okay, well, easier said than done, right? Because <laughs> some of them are really good things. Some of you are waiting for some stuff out there. You're waiting for healing or some other blessing in your life. Some of you have stuff, and maybe you're a little bit lulled to sleep right now. Life is real good, and you're not thinking about a whole lot. I'm not saying you can't enjoy your life. Realistic but grateful, right? Some of you lost some things. You lost a long time ago. And if you're honest, you've been struggling. So stop grasping. Okay, Steve, how do we do that? How? Well, remember earlier on in the message, that Sunday school answer? I told you it was the answer. But you got to be challenged by the question in order to live like you know the answer. Jesus. I'm not going to drop the mic. I promise I'm not going to do that. That's it? Just Jesus, that's it? Okay, yes, that's it. But here's the, here's the thing. What specifically about Jesus enables me to not grasp at the smoke of my life and to let him decide and to grab onto him? What is it exactly? I'm glad you asked. <clears throat> glad you asked. For that, we need to go to Philippians 2. Um, I, the, one of the many, many things that I love about Jesus is that he gets me. He gets me, and he gets you too. He really does. He gets you, understands you, understands what it's like to be you. He knows what it's like to go through the cycle of grasping. He knows what it's like to go through the thing that Solomon identified in Ecclesiastes. 
He knows what it's like to be someone who wants something. He knows what it's like to have something, and he knows what it's like to lose it. And here's how we know, because Philippians 2, verse 6, says this, says this in the NIV, who, this is Jesus, being in very nature God, okay, that's a pretty big I have, right? Did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Now, the, and the new NIV translates a word in there, and it translates it to be used to his own advantage. He gets, they get the essence of it, and it's awesome. I love that they made that adjustment. But I'm going to go to a slightly more literal translation of this verse so you get what's going on here for today. For though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be, read that word, grasped. Jesus, living an earthly life, the smoke of his life going by him. He's got friends. He's got family. And, by the way, though we think we actually, we think we have things in our hands when we live life and we don't, Jesus actually did. He had it all. He had it all. And he refused to grasp it, which means to cling to it and refuse to lose it because it benefits you, because it brings you something. You think think having equality with God brings Jesus something? I think it does. It's probably pretty cool. Not good for me. Really good for him. He didn't didn't grasp it. What What if this is how we have meaning that doesn't go away in a world where everything does? Who could be trusted more to decide what comes and goes in your life than the one who knows what it's like to actually lose everything? He did not grasp it, and God crushed him. And he crushed him specifically so that he could bring us a reality where we wouldn't lose things anymore. So we could bring us a reality in which we would not, it would not be smoke. It would not be hevel. It would not be meaningless. It would be meaningful. It would last forever. That's what he did. He went to the cross to bring an end to the reality that we're in. To bring us a better reality, a new earth. Where things don't go away. I love the way that Paul says it a few verses later. He says it in uh, Philippians 3, 12. Uh, he says this. He says that I, I am pressing on toward the goal to take hold of that for which Christ has taken a hold of me. What if the one who refused to grasp at his own life so that he could take hold of you, what if he's inviting you to not grasp what's in your life so you can take hold of him? Because not only him, but what he's going to bring. Jesus trusted, God exalted. Jesus trusted, God resurrected. And he wants to do the very same thing for you. And if you've not given your life to Christ today, I really, 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 man, don't let another day go by. You are consigning yourself to a life that is temporary when Jesus wants to bring you a life that you're never going to lose again. A resurrected body that isn't going to go away, where I'm not going to look in the mirror and go, man, I look tired for the fourth year in a row. Right? This is what, this is the gospel. This is what we have. This is what we have that the rest of the world doesn't have. See, the rest of the world has two but opposite responses to the problem of the brevity of life. Either cynical, get cynical. Well, everything sucks. Everything's always going to suck. It's just the way it is. Just got to survive. Or what we call in the seminary the- theological world hedonism. It means just make it all about pleasure. Hey, you do you. You go after what makes you happy. You just be yourself. Just do that. Who cares what anybody else thinks or does? Just go and do that. Then you'll have the life that you want, except maybe you won't because they're not magic beans. And then before you know it, you fool. Two responses. Jesus offers a third way. I love the way that my my professor, seminary professor I've got, Dr. Mike Whitmer, he wrote a book called uh, Worldly Saints, Becoming Worldly Saints. If you haven't read it, you should. And in it, I love, I love what he says. He says this. He said, matter matters. Redemption matters more. The stuff that we have matter. Our lives, temporary. But here, matter matters. It's important, right? That's why if you've received a diagnosis, you should fight for life, man. You should fight for it because it's good. 
But there's a difference between fighting for life and grasping at life. You can fight for life and be joyful and trust God and let him decide. You can do that. Matter matters. Redemption matters more. So the best of life, I can enjoy it full-throated without worrying about when it's going to go away. And when I lose those things, I'm going to grieve, but I'm going to be hopeful because I know redemption matters more. The thing that's coming, what Jesus is bringing, the redemption, the restoration, the resurrection, the new earth, that stuff matters more and it's bigger and it's better. And that's why he is more beautiful and more amazing than anything that you think you can grab your hands to in this life. He just is. I want, I have, I lost. Wherever you are in those places, Jesus will meet you. He will meet you in that place. He will help you heal from being a grasper, and he will help you become somebody who every day learns how to let go. Because you're going to have to. You're going to wake up the next morning like this. And you learn how to do it, and slowly but surely, you'll become a person who's more like him and is looking straight at him and clinging to him for your meaning and purpose. Solomon was right. Don't grasp at life. So you'll actually be able to enjoy it, but you'll be able to enjoy even more the life to come because that's where the hope comes from.